Welcome to Biochemistry Part 1. There's going to be four parts total, but the fourth part is going to be on a separate note packet. So the first three parts, um, all about macromolecules, are going to be on this packet that you have. Please don't lose the packet. Um, took a lot of work to put it together, and um, it's worth a grade. So, um, and remember, when you're submitting it, always submit one PDF file because you scanned every single sheet to make one PDF file. Do not, set, do not submit multiple files, okay? And if I need me to go over that with you again, um, I can, okay? So, biochemistry. You had a bell work question. Hopefully, you were spending the, your pre-class time wisely and answering that question, okay? So, um, we kind of talked about this word uh, yesterday when we did our bell work and um, and then we watched that video about chemicals in food and in nature, organic versus um, inorganic and stuff like that. And um, uh, so you should have written down something like biochemistry is focuses on the chemical aspect of life and not biology proper, which is all life and the interactions between organisms and studying fish and birds and mammals and, and even the evolution of those things. So biology is more encompassing. Biochemistry is just one little tiny piece of it, okay? And um, chemistry that focuses not on life at all, but just on chemicals. So that, that's, that's the major differences. So like I said, this is going to be part one. It's only going to be 30 slides of the 70 some odd slides that we have to do. That's why I broke it up into three parts because it's a lot of words. It's a lot of new definitions, a lot of um, pictures, diagrams, and labeling and things like that. So, so all living things are composed of large molecules called biochemical compounds. Yeah, there are some small molecules in there too. You know, carbon dioxide plays a role and H2O plays a role. Um, and even um, smaller things, um, like oxygen, just two molecules, two atoms together to make one oxygen molecule. And that's what we breathe. And that's what travels around in our body, but not that simply. Um, so all biochemicals are organic. I and mean, we learned about what that word means. We know that um, that has the, the chon or the honk, C-H-O-N or H-O-N-C, okay? Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen. Carbon, here they're saying specifically carbon and hydrogen, but um, just know that it's that C-H-O-N, chan, okay, or hong. And the large compounds of life are sometimes called macromolecules. Macro means big, micro means small, so, and they're molecules, meaning that they're more than one atom connected together. Macro molecules. All the life functions of organisms um, are because of these macromolecules. And there are four main classes. There's the carbohydrates, the uh, fats, which are called technically called lipids, um, proteins, and nucleic acids. And the th these three parts of the slides are going to cover all four of these until we get to the very last one, nucleic acids. And we don't talk too much about nucleic acids uh, during this part because nucleic acids are more uh, in a different part of the notes, okay? <clears throat> and here are those examples. So you've got carbohydrates over here, your grains and breads and, and pretzels, which is all grains, okay? And sugars, right? <clears throat> here you have um, proteins. Proteins can be in both vegetables and meats, okay? So if you've got a hundred calorie piece of meat or 100 calorie piece of broccoli, this is how much protein is going to be in there. 8.2 grams versus uh, 12 to 14 um, grams of protein, okay? And you have to eat a, a, a lot more um, vegetable total weight than, and, than uh, meat. But you can still get all of your protein from vegetables if you don't eat meat. So either way, you're getting your protein that you need. And here's oils and fats, margarines and butter and bacon and stuff like that, cheeses, dairy products. And then your DNA 
and your RNA, which is your genetic material in all of your cells, most of your cells, um, is your nucleic acids, okay? So uh, a polymer, polymer is a new word. Poly means many. So many bio, biochemical compounds are um, macromolecules macromolecule, called polymers. Um, a polymer is a molecule composed of many smaller things. So here you have a polymer, and then in the polymer, making up the polymer, this chain right here is something called a monomer. Mono means one. Poly means many, mono means one. And so the many is made up of lots, a chain of ones. Pretty simple, okay? The many is made up of a chain of ones, <clears throat> the monomers. And then the lines are uh, chemical bonds holding those monomers together to make a polymer. All the smaller subunits in any given type of polymer are similar to each other in some way. So these monomers are similar to each other and these monomers are similar to each other. And they can repeat in a repeating chain. The subunits are linked by covalent bonds. So those chemical bonds up here in these little um, lines, those are covalent bonds, not ionic bonds like uh, salt, okay? These are organic materials, so they're covalently bonded. Remember uh, in our previous unit, uh, that was um, sharing of electrons, not giving and taking, but sharing. So it's like what holds water together, what I was just talking about, okay? Through the process of synthesis. To synthesize means to make. You're all familiar with the word photosynthesis. That means making from photo, from light. Photosynthesis. And um, linking the subunits to form polymers requires energy. So in order to make this happen, in order to make the monomers covalently bond together, you need to put some sort of energy into that. We'll learn more about the energy part of it later in this class, but for now just know that that's what it takes, okay? So you filled in all of these on your paper. Remember, if you ever miss anything, you can, this link is on YouTube, and you can go to Google Classroom and click on the link and fast forward to the part you missed. Or when we have time at the end of the period, if we do, um, you can always just jot it down from a neighbor, okay? And uh, the structure of monomers versus polymers. So here's a monomer, small molecule, not water, because water's inorganic. Okay, but organic. And then he, he, th this is taking multiple monomers, one, two, three, four, and chains of possibly a, of, of 100, um, to make many or a polymer. Repeated pattern of monomers, a polymer. So here's an analogy. You know what an analogy is, right? It's like a comparison of one thing to another just to make a point. Okay, so an analogy here is imagine a beaded necklace, like uh, a beaded necklace, or <laughs> like a plastic bead, so you can get it like Mardi Gras or something like that, or um, a pearl necklace, okay, you know, with actual real pearls. So the necklace consists of many beads that are strung together with either a monofilament, like a fishing line, or string of some kind, to form a chain, a chain link. So you're going to use the information above to answer the questions in your notes, okay? So what does the entire chain represent? And that is going to be, I'm only going to do the first one with you, the rest of them you can do together on your own. And that's going to be the polymer, okay? So later on, at the end of the period, or for homework tonight, when you're supposed to be reading these, yes, you, right there, you're supposed to be reading these notes for homework tonight, just the first set. Take you five, 10 minutes max, all right? Um, especially those of you who, didn't, who needed to do a little bit better on the last test we took. So just continue to answer these questions. Label this polymer. You're gonna label the bond um, and the subunit and the polymer together. You're gonna just put those three words down on there, okay?
Okay, so here are some diagrams that you have in your notes that represent examples of polymers from each of the main classes of macromolecules. That's the last one. Um, for each polymer, circle and, and locate uh, or label, label the subunit, all right? So this is starch. This is when you take a whole bunch of glucose, we learned this from that video we watched yesterday, um, a whole bunch of glucose molecules, and you bond them together with covalent bonds, and you get a polymer of glucose called starch. And that's the subunit, and the subunit is glucose. So label that on your paper. Each one of those is a glucose connected together. Two of these is essentially the sugar that's in this coffee, or the sugar in any of your sodas or, you know, cakes or whatever, okay? <clears throat> Sucrose, oh, sorry, glucose is the subunit for that. This is the second one called a fatty acid, um, which makes a lipid, and you can see this repeating chain, right, of smaller subunits, in this case, the, the, the subunits are called hydrocarbons, each one of these connected by a covalent bond. And then don't worry about what this end is here, but that's just a, a group that um, we'll talk about later, okay? <clears throat> so the fatty acid subunit is called a hydrocarbon. The polypeptide, this is what forms a protein, and again, we're going to talk about each one of these individual units after uh, we go over the, just the introduction part. And so this is, so you've got one, two of the same, then you've got a different one, a different one, and then two other ones here. So proteins form a little bit differently. They still make a polymer, but the subunits called peptides, or sorry, amino acids, which the bonds are peptides, we'll talk about peptides later. The subunits called amino acids are different. They're like a puzzle piece almost, like a, a dial um, lock, like a bike lock that has a dial on it, you know, one, two, three, four. And so you can have a certain number of combinations if you change the different kinds of amino acids to subunits, you make multitude of different kinds of uh, proteins, which we'll talk about later, okay? So an amino acid, and circle that in your notes, is the subunit for that. And then the final one, one strand, this is a strand of DNA, deoxyribonucleic acid. You don't have to know what that is yet. You will in the future. Um, and so each one of these subunits is called a nucleotide. And we'll talk about those at the end of, at the end of these notes in a few days. We're not going to get to these today, okay? So the nucleotide, spell it right. That's the spelling right there. So we've seen this before. Honk, if you love biochemistry. And the honk refers to the four organic uh, atoms, elements, <laughs> from the periodic table of the elements, okay? That's why I have it in the back of the room so that it's always referenced, you can always reference it. It's always there for all of the elements that we need. Um, and if anybody is a fan of, or have ever watched a Supernatural episode, this is the car in all of the episodes. So uh, 1967 um, Chevy Impala, very nice car. <clears throat> so which elements are found in the biochemical compounds? Which ones are found? And so, we already named them. Hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, carbon, these are in your notes. And so this table, you have to fill in on your notes. So do that right now while I present to you the information, okay? So we know the symbol is, hydro, is H for hydrogen, O for oxygen, N, and C because it spells honk or chong. And then the number of bonds that each form is extremely important in determining what kind of chemicals, organic chemicals, they can make. So obviously, 
Carbon is the most versatile. Carbon can make four bonds, so it can have a lot more combinations than, say, hydrogen or oxygen. Got it? Okay. So which of the four elements forms the greatest number of bonds? I just told you. Please write C on your notes, carbon. And then why are all biochemical compounds considered to be organic? Because they have what two major elements from the honk in there? Carbon and hydrogen, okay? They all have carbon, C, and hydrogen, H, okay? So these diagrams represent atoms of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon in some, form, um, some random order. They're randomly organized. Each line represents the ability to form a covalent bond with some other element. And it's actually an unpaired electron that needs a partner. So if you remember from physical science, you know that um, the valence electrons need to have a total of either two for hydrogen um, or eight for any other atom. They need to be, so that's why they, um, unpaired electrons need to be paired up to be stable, right? So use the previous information on the previous page to write the names of each atom that represents this, uh, the pictures, okay? So obviously the first one's going to be hydrogen because it has one, can form one bond. You're gonna do the rest uh, by yourself. Okay, why is carbon the backbone of life? We're on slide 15, by the way. So we're halfway through um, this presentation. Um, the reason why organic molecules can become so large and complex is because carbon atoms can attach themselves to one another. Other things can't do that organically, okay? Um, to an extent not possible for the other ones. They, they, it's, and that's what I mean by to an extent. They can a little bit, but not to make organic compounds, to make inorganic compounds. Like uh, oxygen can, can bond to itself to make O2, which is the air, you know, part of the air that we breathe, but that's not organic, okay? So that's what they mean by to an extent. So make sure you're filling this in on page, on slide 15 of your notes. They can form chains, carbon atoms can form chains thousands of atoms or molecules long, okay? Rings of all different sizes, like uh, glucose we know is a ring-shaped molecule. Um, and they have branches that branch off and cross links. Other atoms like hydrogen, oxygen, and nitrogen can attach to those chains and those rings to make a great number of variations. I mean, if you look around at living things, look at the posters in the, in the room, um, or the examples of life over here in the cabinets, Life is just so varied and so amazing that, and then just throw plants in there too, plants, that we have to have all these different variations. And so that, that makes it a, a complex number of variations. So, and that's how, like I was just saying, they can carry out all the life functions of all these organisms, all these plants and animals that we know about. So you are going to, in your notes, write down some of these, it says write down four or something like that that you're familiar with. You should be familiar with some of them. I'll read them for you. Respiration, nutrition, transport. That's like transport of things in the body or, or in a plant, not transport like, like cars and trucks, okay, and ships. Growth and development. Uh, we will do that in the second semester. Locomotion, reproduction, second semester, I think. Um, response to stimuli, like does it go away from light or toward light? Those kinds of things. Or pain, um, hunger, those types, types of that's what stimuli are. Synthesis, creating, like making things. Um, excretion, getting rid of wastes. And regulation, that's um, maintaining body temperature and things like that. So just write down um, three or four of those. Okay, here's another test yourself. So you're gonna do this at a later time. Um, Large compounds of life, you know, that's kind of obvious. That's the macromolecule. That's what this uh, whole presentation is about today. And um, you guys are going to use your notes. So go back and use your notes at the end of the period or tonight 
um, to finish those off, okay? All right, we're on slide 17, and we're talking about carbohydrates. So now we are, um, this is part two of this first part. It's not part two of the whole notes. That comes next time. So um, carbohydrates is the first one of the four macromolecules that we are talking about in these notes. And carbohydrates, you've heard the word, carbs, many times people say them, nutritionists and things, and your coach will say, eat a lot of carbs before your meat, you know, tomorrow or whatever. Um, these are organic compounds that contain carbon, hydrogen, and oxygen. There's no nitrogen in carbohydrates. Save those for the other macromolecules. And the ratio is always two to one. Okay, the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen is always two to one in carbohydrates. So you're always gonna have two hydrogens uh, to one oxygen. So there's always going to be double the amount of hydrogen as there is oxygen in every one of these molecules. Okay, every one of these macromolecules. Um, carbo means carbon. Hydrates means water, which also has a ratio of two to one for hydrogen and oxygen. Carbohydrates are broken down or used directly to provide cells with immediate energy. So you, if you need immediate energy, if your body needs immediate energy, you're gonna eat carbs. Um, other things like proteins and fats, they take a lot more time to break down and a lot more energy. So these are the fastest, that's why when you have sugar, you're like, you know, bouncing around. But if you eat like turkey, you're like, you know, sleeping. Um, so, so several foods that are good sources of carbohydrates include bread, that says bread. Can I move this thing down here? Okay. Uh, bread, pasta, and rice, those are complex carbs which is, are what you should eat. You should not eat simple carbs. So like candy, honey, and syrup. That's virtually pure sugar. You should try to you know, keep those really low in your diet, all right? But the bread, pasta, and rice, that, that, but not too much, of course. So simple sugars are called monosaccharides. Mono meaning one. Saccharide just means uh, sugar, okay? So the simplest are the monosaccharides. So I think you have to write that down. So foods containing only monosaccharides taste very sweet. And again, we said that that was candy, honey, and syrup from the last slide. The monosaccharides are also subunits or monomers of polymers, okay, of complex carbohydrates like the pasta and the breads and the rice we saw on the last slide. So these are the building blocks, the smaller pieces, the simple sugars, the mono, meaning one, makes the poly many. Remember that. They're like the rungs of a ladder or the pearls of a pearl necklace, the individual pearls. The most common example is glucose, which plants make. When they take energy from the sun, they take uh, water and carbon dioxide and put it together, they arrange it together in such a way that it makes that glucose molecule, that hexagonal ring glucose molecule. So and glucose and fructose are isomers, and that's, they have the same molecular formula, um, but which is, let me move this, which is C6H12O6, <clears throat> but different structures. So just like that alpha glucose and beta glucose, the alpha glucose could, could connect in straight chains like this, but the beta glucose was flipped. The only way they could do it is they flip upside down and that, and that makes them stronger. So fructose is very, fructose is also called fruit sugar. <clears throat> so it's the, it's the monosaccharide that's fat, that makes uh, fruit sweet. Oh, and um, anything that ends in os, is a sugar. So if you're buying something and you're trying to stay low on sugar and you're like, oh, there's no sugar in here, but then three um, ingredients down, it says something with the os at the end. That means there's a sugar in there, but they're hiding it. 
So be smart. And that's the structure of glucose right there. So what is the molecular formula for glucose? It was just on the last slide. So you're going to do this. Um, how does it compare to fructose? Last slide. And what is the ratio of hydrogen to oxygen for those two things? And it's also in your notes before. So we're not going to throw those answers up right now. All right. How are complex carbohydrates made? So complex carbohydrates are made by the process of synthesis. Synthesis means to make. So um, it's a process by which smaller molecules are combined to make, wait for it, larger molecules, okay? Synthesizing. You're taking smaller things, like, like the parts of an engine, and you're putting it together to make a one unit. A bigger unit made up of smaller parts, but you're synthesizing that engine. You're making it out of smaller parts. And those smaller parts are called monosaccharides because we're talking about carbohydrates right now. And monosaccharides are the monomers, one, of complex carbohydrates. So you've got substance A and substance B. They have a chemical reaction where their bonds are made with covalent bonds and you get a new substance. The um, monomers to polymers, okay? And we said this before, sometimes monosaccharides are called simple sugars or just glucose molecules. So a double sugar, two sugars, is called a disaccharide. And here's a test taking tip, so that's stuff that's gonna be on your future test. Count the atoms, how many carbons, hydrogens, oxygens. So um, make sure that you are able to do this. Each one of these corners is a carbon, except for where that, that oxygen is right there. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six. That's your C6. And same here, okay? Uh, if you count how many hydrogens, it's going to be 12. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Wait, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11. Oh, yeah, because if it was just one molecule, that'd be 12. But because there's, it's a disaccharide, it loses one of them. And I'll show you how that happens. Um, so there's going to be 11 and 11, 22. So it's going to be 6 and 6, 12. 12 carbons, 22 hydrogens. And then you can, you can count the oxygens by yourself. It's pretty, just count, this, count the O's, okay? Um, and so what is the molecular formula for maltose? Oh, yeah, that, sorry, that was maltose. It says it right there. <clears throat> one, this is one example. There are lots of other examples, okay? Um, so C12, like I said, H22, 11 and 11. And if you counted the number of oxygens, you'd get 11 total. One, two, three, four, five, and five plus one in the middle. Five and five and one is 11. And how does the molecular formula show Maltese as a carbohydrate? Because it's a two to one ratio, like I said before. Two to one. There's twice as many hydrogens as there are oxygens. So that proves that it is a carbohydrate because of the two to one ratio every single time. So this is the um, synthesis, okay? You have to, it's called a dehydration because you're taking water out, removal of water. You're removing water from this right here. Two glucoses go through a chemical reaction where they bond and they take out that, that's what I said, I'll show you later where the hydrogen leaves. Because um, it was originally, um, if you count, there's six and no, 12 and 12, right? Yeah, so each one would have C6H12, yes. Each one of these would have 12, and you're getting rid of two of them, one from each, which makes them 11 and 11 for a total of 22. Um, so they're coming together to make this uh, disaccharide. Di meaning two, right? So mono meaning one, di meaning two, poly meaning many. And in this, this case, it's maltose. Remember, anything with ose is uh, 
is a sugar. And this is dehydration synthesis. Dehydration because you're removing water and you get a new molecule because of it, okay? And so here is, so yeah, circle that, and that water ends up over here. And then these two come together to bond in a covalent bond, making that. And so you've got your glucose, glucose making maltose. A monomer and a monomer making, or monosaccharide and monosaccharide, same thing, making a disaccharide. And these are the reactants, these are the things that are reacting, and these are the products, these are the things produced. Reactants and products. I know none of you probably had chemistry yet, because you're only 10th grade, but um, this will be really helpful when you start chemistry, um, if you take chemistry. All right? Oh yeah, and of course, that's water up there. So make sure you label that in your notes. <clears throat> Reactants, products, and water. Okay, so you're going to answer these questions later. Um, let's move on. On slide 24, so make sure you mark that for later. Because it's just a review. And now we've got the polysaccharides. So we went from monosaccharides to disaccharides to multiple chains. And that's, good. that's poly, many. So the process of dehydration and synthesis can continue until a chain of many monosaccharides forms. Now, since polysaccharide molecules and chains are composed of many monosaccharides, you need a lot of covalent bonds. Um, and, connect, and they're called polymers. Okay? The monosaccharides are monomers, building blocks of the polymers. So here is a very simplified version of glucose molecules coming together. One, two, three, four of them, all monomers, coming together to make a many, a polymer. Just like that necklace we talked about earlier, that analogy of the necklace earlier. And so that's polysaccharides are complex carbs, carbs again, like breads, rice, um, grains, okay? So what's a starch? A starch is made by plants. Animals can't make starch. And they're used to store extra glucose that was made during photosynthesis um, for energy for later. So plants will store, like potatoes for example. They make those roots, those tubers that we call a potato, and then the plant will die off, and then they're storing energy for the spring. Winter comes, the tuber stays in the ground, the potato, the root, and then next year the energy, a plant comes out. It's without any sunlight under the ground. It's pretty amazing how they can do that. When animals eat starch, they digest it. They break it down, right, in their, in their systems, and they produce glucose, which down to the cellular level, which we use that glucose to do this, <laughs> and do this, and do that, so live, two of our living functions. And uh, the life process that breaks down these glucose and releases it, breaking the chemical bonds, is called respiration. So it's the opposite, and that's the potato tubers I was talking about before, it's the opposite of what plants do, photosynthesis. If you took the chemical reaction and flipped it around, that would be, um, what we're talking about. So we are on slide 27 now. What is cellulose? Cellulose, we talked about uh, with the cows eating corn in the video yesterday. Um, when the beta glucose molecules, one of them has to flip and then the other one flips over here. And so, and they make this very strong material. It's strong, like, like wood. You know cellulose and that's it's fiber it's in it's in the vegetables that we eat it's not in the animals we eat because animals don't make cellulose um, but but plants do that's how a plant uh, grows up and straight and doesn't fall over 
and get all squishy, like, a, you know, animals, we're squishy, right? Um, but plants have that cellulose fibers to keep them strong. So, and so obviously it's made by plants, right? I said that already. And it's a major component of the cell walls of the plant cells. And all those cell walls combining together, that's how you get wood. That's how you get a stick. That's what makes that snap sound when you snap a bean, a, you know, a green bean or a stick in half, you know? Um, but like we said yesterday, also many animals lack what's called an enzyme. We're not gonna talk about enzymes right now. Um, that's the end of the biochemical unit. We'll talk about those and next week sometime, okay? So they lack an enzyme needed to di digest that cellulose. And so animals like humans can't digest it either. We pass it through the digestive tract, relatively unchanged. Um, and that's what feces is, okay? Plant fiber is composed mainly of cellulose. Here's some pictures of the cellulose fibers, the, the running through the plant, okay? And it's sometimes called roughage. So if a doctor, you know, if you're having problems going to the bathroom and the doctor says you have to have more roughage, that's what the doctor's talking about. You have to have more cellulose, which is a polymer, because we're talking about monomers and polymers, and um, it's a polysaccharide. So it's multiple monomers of glucose all bound together to make this very strong material. You're writing on paper right now. The paper is also made out of cellulose. It's wood fibers that have been chopped up very fine, you know, made wet, and then uh, put into sheets and bleached. That's why it's white. You can buy unbleached paper. It looks kind of brown, not dark brown, but like um, a light brown, I guess. Um, some people like that for, for writing on. And um, so you're going to find it in your foods, like corn and leaves, peppers, you know, other vegetables, vegetation like that. And these are the cell walls of a plant. Okay. These are the chlorophyll um, moving around in the plant. So because if, if the sunlight is hitting from a different direction, it will, uh, they'll move to get more sunlight. It's pretty cool. We'll talk about that more in the future. All right, we're almost done. We have one more slide after this. I think we're finished. So here's the um, termite, very similar to cows in what they do. They, uh, they also lack the enzyme. Cows don't have the enzyme either. They have, that, they have this symbiotic relationship called mutualism with these bacteria, these microbes in their gut that break down the cellulose for them, break apart those beta, those, uh, beta glucose molecules into usable sugars and so that gives the animal energy to do its thing so um nutrition that's what it's all about is getting unlocking those bonds those chemical bonds in these uh macromolecules in these polysaccharides to release energy energy to move to breathe to think and to live out life cycles, okay? So it's breaking these up into smaller pieces. All right, and this is our final slide. You'll see there's a stop sign on your notes as well at on the bottom of page six, I believe, um, and uh, slide 30. So this is the human, we, we were just talking about plants, so now we're gonna talk about animals. Glycogen is made by animals, okay? And it's stored in the liver. Many animals, including us humans, um, we make glycogen to remove excess glucose molecules from the bloodstream and we store it. And we store it in the liver, which is like right over here, liver, okay? And so when blood sugar is low, the liver responds by breaking down this polysaccharide called glycogen, the pearl necklace, okay? It breaks it down into smaller usable pieces that we can use for energy, okay? It goes back into the bloodstream. So it maintains a constant level 
of glucose sugar in the bloodstream, okay? And so this is an example of homeostasis. Um, homo or homeo, that kind of means the same. Stasis is the stasis or the status of the organism. So it maintains the same status. It tries to anyway. Sometimes people get sick or maybe they have diabetes or something like that, which is more insulin related than glycogen related, but we'll talk about that in the future too. Um, so a constant internal conditions, that's what homeostasis means. And again, we'll be talking more about that in the future. And so glycogen is a weird, is a, a kind of a different uh, polysaccharide, many, many sugars, right? Because it's branched. It has a branch right there. It, brand, it doesn't go in a line. It has a branched off region. So that's what makes uh, glycogen unique among the polysaccharides. But there are many other polysaccharides as well. So that's the notes for today. Um, make sure you go back, use the rest of the class time to answer those little test yourselves and other parts. Um, you can work with the neighbor, that's fine, okay?